again, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us on our webinar this morning. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, everybody's in um, uh, is in listen-only mode on the webinar, so if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat um, at the bottom of the screen as we're going along, and I'll cover those as we're going, or I'll uh, reach out to you at the end um, and answer those questions. Um, I'll also give my contact information further on in the webinar um, so you can reach out to me if you have any questions or want to follow up on specific functionality afterwards. Okay, so as we start, for those of you who haven't are uh, just joining us for the first time in our webinar, we usually we take a step back through and, and uh, look at the webinars we've covered off so far so you can get an idea of of, um, of what our, BC, our ERP Unlocked uh, webinar series is about. So when we started our webinar series, we, we started following the inventory as we do during our implementations from, from receiving all the way through to usage and we looked at specific functionality around global trade and things like that. Um, and then when we moved into our series last year, we started introducing some of our partners in the um, in the channel. So we started introducing uh, uh, NAV Payroll um, and also some of our, some of our ISV products like BC EDI and Pack and Ship. Um, and then this year we started off with our in our BC portals functionality. Uh, and then when Business Central was introduced, we we looked at what Business Central is and what does that mean for NAV. Uh, and we went through withdrawals and QA incidents. We, we revisited NAV Payroll because there's been a lot of changes to that product as we've gone along as well. Um, and then last webinar, we looked at route planning with proof of delivery and direct store delivery. Um, and then this web webinar today, we'll be talking about grower accounting. Um, and then our webinar coming up, the, the invitations will be going out shortly for, we'll be looking at uh, one of our partners, Jet Reports, for reporting uh, functionality. All of our webinars are up on our website, so if there's somebody who missed any, if you want to revisit any of these webinars in the past, or if there's somebody who couldn't make it to today's webinar and afterwards you think that would be useful, um, it'll be posted up to our website by the end of the, end of the day, and I'll give you a link later on in our webinar series, uh, later on in the slide, sorry. So today we'll be talking about grower accounting. Um, so we'll be talking, and you know, and grower accounting um, is really uh, the core of our grower payments and and uh, commodity receiving integration to scale uh, functionality. It's much more than accounting, as the as the name actually says, um, and involves you know, as I mentioned, integration to the scale and QA and um, and that sort of thing. So well, first we'll start with some of our setup. So we'll look at how you can set up growers, uh, what a grower is. Um, how you can track things like fields and crops and, and, and uh, ranches and blocks and things like that. Um, we'll show the integration to the scale and quality areas, and then we'll look at grower payments and settlements. Okay, and we'll in, 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 inside of that we'll look at lien holders as well as we go through that. Okay, so let's jump into our demo here. Okay, so I'm just going to open up our Business Central. So today I'll um, and in our last webinar as well I'm. Um, trying to do all of our latest webinar series on the, the uh, Business Central web client. Um, the, the, uh, as those of you who joined us in our webinar about Business Central, we do still have the option to use a Windows client, a Roll Taylor client as well, but I'm trying to do all our webinars here so we can kind of get, get used to this, the, the, the web interface, which is accessed through a web browser. Okay, so one of the first things um, you know we'll look at is we'll look at some of the setup as I mentioned because that's really the core of how you can um, and that that'll lead into our, our commodity contracts, commodity receiving, and then our settlements process. So let's first first look at our um, our growers. Okay, so I'm just going to do our search for our growers, and you can see some other options come in here which we'll talk about in blocks and fields. So I have a few growers set up here, and the one we're going to be using today is Bex Family Farms, of course. Um, so when you open up a grower card, you'll see here that you know the grower has a unique number from a number series. It's linked to a vendor, okay? Because all of the transactions we need to do with this grower are related to receiving and paying, okay? Because we're receiving, you know, a commodity like berries or nuts or grains or rice or something like that, um, and we're then going to be processing payments and things through those. So we link it to the vendor, populates all the uh, standard vendor information. I have a primary payee number here of who I want to pay, uh, default location code, and I can set up some ranches and blocks and fields down here. All right. One of the other things I can do up here um, is under the grower button is um, I can set up uh, all my ranches. I can access those here as well. So let's just jump into ranches for this grower. 
Okay, so I've set up a couple of different ranches and I can set up different name address uh, information uh, associated with that as well. Um, and I can set up notes and things like that as well. So I can set up my ranches there under that button. Um, I can get into my blocks, my fields. So I'm just gonna go directly down to the fields because you'll see when I can set up a field here. Let's just open up this one. Okay, you'll see that when I look down to the field, which is kind of our lowest level, we have you know what grower that's related to, what ranch, block, and um, a field ID, and also what crop year is actually get growing on that um, on that field when I set that up. I can set up the number of acres, bed size, what date it was actually planted, what when am I expected to harvest that, you know what my wet date is, and what the commodity item is as well. Okay. So I'm just going to go back to our ranch number one here, and you can see I filled in some other information here. This is one of the ones we're going to use in our in our demonstration today. So I've actually added the code here and my commodity item and the variety that's actually coming in there. So here, when I look at commodity items, that kind of leads into our discussion here. I'm just going to select from my full list, and you'll see that you can have um, a list of items, commodity items in here, and you can link those to a standard BCE, uh, you know, Business Central item. So as I scroll down here, you'll see here we have a lot, some tomatoes down here. Okay, so all of these tomatoes actually all link into the same item. They may be different varieties, but when I am actually receiving them and I'm just receiving those as a single item in the system. Okay, so that allows me to track things like variety and things like that at the lot information level um, and then keep, to, and keep my item master kind of tight and clean rather than having a variety of item masters, okay? A variety of tomato items for that same thing. It doesn't stop you from having a unique item per commodity item either, okay? So I have my commodity item um, the, uh, for our, our demonstration today. I'm going to be looking at baby spinach and the Savoy is going to be the uh, variety code I have there. Um, I see how much I have on contract and how much I've received on contract related to all of these parameters. Okay, and that's the contract we're going to be looking at as we go through and, um, and look at some of those. Okay, and down here in the pay section, you'll see that I can actually do a pay payment split here. So I can default this at the at the field level. So if there's a relationship between the grower and you know the uh, and who they're leasing the land from um, and that sort of thing, so I can actually split the uh, the amounts that are due to that uh, based on this field. I can split that between. You know, if the grower says, I want you to pay 10% of the crop to the landlord and then, you know, 80% to me and then, you know, 10% to somebody else, things like that. So I can actually set those uh, parameters up here and do splitting, which we'll look at a little bit later in our, in our review. Okay. So an escape, use my escape to get to jump back to my, my, uh, to my grower here. Okay, and then um, let's see if I can, uh, what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for my payment terms. We'll see that when we get into our commodity contracts. Okay, so I do have all my standard functionality here with my fact boxes. I can set up comments and instructions. I have my links and I have my document basket here that I can drag and drop documents in. So if I've sent a contract out to this, this grower or this grower has sent me some specific sp spray reports or something like that, then I can drag and drop those into here and those are uh, tagged to the, uh, on the grower card. Okay, so jumping back to the main menu, I'm not going to go into my search now, and I'm actually going to jump into, well, let's jump right into tr some of our transaction processing and see how this all pulls together. Okay, so I'm going to start with a commodity contract. Okay, um, and, um, and this is really setting up, um, this is based on um, our, our, you know, our contract, our purchase contract functionality, um, and it just gives us a little bit more information um, related to, gr to grower contracts. So, I do have my unique number here. I have the grower and, and as we saw before, the ranch block field and the field ID, um, who the buy from vendor is, uh, what the contract starting and ending date is, and then what my contract quantity that I've, I've actually committed to, okay? And then also I can fill in information here about what the order number is and things like that, um, or if the contract has ended up closed. So, and if I've come to the end of the season, everything's been harvested from the field, I can close the contract, meaning that I don't want to receive anything more against it. It's locked. Okay. I'm just going to scroll down here into the lines a little bit. So now we see our commodity item code. Okay. So when I fill in the commodity item, it automatically pulls in an item number and the variety and the description. I can fill in what the crop year is related to that field. 
um, and then what my contract amount is. I've set this contract up for 110,000 pounds. Okay, brings in my con starting and ending date, and then the cost I'm actually going to pay. I've agreed to pay for that item per pound. Okay. When I get into my lines here, um, you know, I'm going to click on the line button here, and I'm just going to talk a bit about document charge components. Okay. So I have a couple of different uh, document charge components here. I can have as many as I want. And what I've done is I've set it up so that um, if they if I receive a product within a certain color number specification, you know, um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them a bonus. Okay. But then also I'm going to dock um, when I find, uh, you know, like foreign materials and too much dirt, you know, things like that. Maybe and we're talking about spinach here, you know, that sort of thing. I'm going to dock them on weight for, for certain, um, you know, for certain amounts that are going to come in. So let's look at the QA rates up here. Um, I can set it up as a single rate here at the line level, or I can actually fill in a rate schedule based on different values. So let's look at our QA rates. So what I've done on the color numbers, I've said that if you know if they per, if they send me something in that um, that I'm measuring as an 85% and up, 85 to 95 actually, I'm going to give them a one cent bonus per pound. Okay. If they if they send me in spinach that is the perfect color that I want, it's a 95 and up. Uh, value, then I'm going to give them a six or a six cent bonus. Okay, and I can fill in as many different categories and levels here as I want for that bonus. Once we look at dockage weight, then I've set up four different dockage categories, a minimum QA value that I'm going to be recording when I receive this item. Okay, and we'll see this on the commodity receipt area. So I have values of two, four, six, and eight, and these are all negatives because I'm going to deduct. Okay, so I'm going to deduct from them on the payment. You know, if they actually, you know, give me, you know, a 2%, um, you know, a 2%, uh, you know, like foreign materials or dirt or things like that that are affecting the weight. Because I don't want to pay for dirt. I'm only paying for the product. Okay. So I can see here that I've put, you know, cents per pound over here as my rates here as well. Okay. So some nice functionality there, um, you know, and, you know, like I'm just going to drill in here so we can see some of the other options that we've set up. Um, so we've got bone, you know, for different categories, we have color, dockage, financing, a bin charge, haul, hauling allowances, shrinkage, etc. Okay, I can even do things like a USDA inspection where I want to actually deduct from that directly because I'm actually billing that back to the vendor for the inspection. Okay, because when we start dealing with a lot of the growers, the growers really their focus is on producing the material, is on you know man measuring the sunlight days, the water, you know managing disease, and then doing the harvesting. They don't usually have a big accounting department to actually do all this payment splitting, writing checks to the USDA, writing checks to you know um, to lien holders and things like that. So they they end up um, a lot of growers we've seen actually push that onto the processor. Okay, because they tend to have more of accounting departments and things like that and are able to manage that sort of process for them. Um, and that's why a lot of these, um, these processes come into place, which we'll see on lien holders and you see here with the USDA inspection as well. Okay. So what I've done there, so as you can see here, so I have a dollar twenty, and I've and I've assessed that whether I want to apply bonuses or dockage, depending on what what's what what actually happens during the receiving process. Um, this is kind of you can see this is kind of a standard purchasing you know document where I have you know invoice ETL, shipping and payment things like that. So I have all my standard functionality there. Okay, when I drill into my payment terms, okay, I'm going to select from my full list here, just so we can see. And what I've done with my uh, with my payment terms is I've actually set up a, a payment schedule here. Okay, so typically when we recommend you're setting up payment terms, you have separate payment terms for growers than you do for your regular vendors because you're going to have a payment, you know, um, you know, splitting generally set up for that. So let's quickly look at the payment schedule here that I've set up for 30 days. So I've said. Um, we, you know, so when I process the receipt, what I want the receipt to do is I want the receipt to split into three vendor ledger entries, okay? So that I can actually cut three separate checks with three separate due dates. So what I'm actually telling the system is with on every receipt, you know, 10 days after the receipt, I wanna pay them 30% and that's gonna be, you know, I'm gonna classify that as a harvest advance, okay? I can set up as many different payment class codes as I want, okay? That's really just a metric and we'll see that when we're suggesting vendor payments. And then conversely, I've said at 60 days, I want to pay them the next 50% of all of the of the receipt. 
And then at the 120 day mark, you know, it's generally when the harvest is actually completed. I've, you know, I've received all of my documentation. I've got spray reports, all of my freight, you know, bills have come in. Then I want to pay them the remaining 20% because that's when I know exactly, you know, how much that I've actually, um, you know, how, how good the product is. And then I've applied all my special charges on it and made sure that I've made my margin and things like that. So I want to hold off on some of that until the very final end. And I'm going to say that's a final payment. Okay. So I can set that payment um, schedule up at the um, at the payment terms code as well. I can also, if it's unique per contract, okay, I can actually go up into my uh, my navigate up here, okay, and I can go up to my order and I can set up a specific payment schedule here for this contract, okay. So you know, if I've negotiated something very specific, you know, related to spinach, I'm receiving a, a bunch of different commodities. Uh, remain lettuce, etc., and each of those have very different payment schedules and things like that. Some of these may be dictated by marketing boards. So we see this often in, in berries and um, peas, corn, very strict commodities, wheat. That these payment terms are actually specified by these by these boards that sit in between the growers and the processors to make sure that the farmers are actually compensated fairly. So some of these are you know not really optional. Some of these are actually set by the commodity uh, by these marketing groups. Okay, so this has to equal 100%, obviously, okay. So we've got our purchase contract, um, our fields, et cetera, the item we're receiving. We've actually set up our, our dockage and our bonus amounts, okay. So what I can do directly from here is because this is, a, this is a contract that actually reacts in the same way that most contracts do in the system that you're probably familiar with, okay. I'm going to scroll over here to the right-hand side, and I'm going to fill in a quantity to receive and create a commodity receipt. Okay, I can also go to the commodity receipt, which I'll show you after, and then pull the contract into that. Okay, so if that's more your process that, you know, a truck arrives at the scale, you immediately create a commodity receipt, you allocate the contract to it, and then start receiving. You can do that as well, or you can have them start at the contract. Okay, so I'm going to say I've got a truck in, and, um, and I'm going to do a 1,000. Okay, so I'm going to go to my actions here, and I'm going to make an order. Okay, create one order from the contract. Okay, it tells me the commodity receipt that it created was 159. I can also go down here to the lines um, and I can say unposted lines and look at commodity receipts and it will show me all the open commodity receipts I have for this, okay? So I've been doing some testing and making sure we had some documents in here. So um, I can click on here and it'll show my document and take me directly to my commodity receipt, okay? So here's my commodity receipt. It looks kind of like the contract. It looks like a PO as well. Okay, it's a receiving document. Okay, I do have my scale over here. All right, so I have my commodity receipt item, um, my branch bl block, etc. All of these things come in. Okay, I'm actually going to now fill in the driver's name. Okay, and you'll see the scale becomes active. You know, after you know once I've started entering some details about the the license plate on the truck. Okay. So now my scales become active. I put my driver's name in and I'm required to put in what the license plate number is. I'm just gonna put some information in there. Okay, I have my Waymaster code for, so I did do a webinar a couple of months ago on specifically around the scale functionality, but we're gonna look at this as well here today. Um, so because I don't have a scale here at home but for a truck to drive onto, okay, I'm gonna actually key in the scale weight, okay? When I actually key into the scale weight, it does, the system actually keeps track of a log to let me know that this was a keyed in weight rather than a weight that actually was received from the scale. Okay, so it does keep track of any overrides into these fields, um, you know, to make sure that, um, that this is, uh, because it's part of regulations for the scale, this is what we need to do. Okay, so I'm going to say the, the, the weight in of the truck is 8,500. Okay, so now I've received my product. Okay, the truck is, you know, either stayed on the scale while I removed the product off, or it's actually gone, you know, unloaded and come back to my scale to be weighed out. Okay, so I want I want something around a thousand. Okay, so I'm going to just do 7,400 is my scale out weight. Okay, immediately pops up my Waymaster certificate. I'm just going to preview this so we can actually see our our document, what this looks like. So once I open up this this Waymaster certificate here, um, you know it gives me that where it was weighed at, the cut, who the customer was, gives me information about the grower field, driver's license, and and uh, and uh, like the truck license number. Uh, sorry. So I have my 8,500 pound weight of the tear weight of the truck and my net weight of my product that I'm actually receiving is 1,100. Okay. So I could typically have the driver sign this on a tablet 
um, and then and then you know print it out, or you know I can print it out. They can sign it, and I can scan it and, and attach it back into the document. Okay, so you'll see what it does. I'm just going to scroll down here before we move on. It does actually keep track of my Waymaster certificate. It automatically adds it to my document basket. So, right? so my document basket functionality, it, it, you know, it automatically, when I close that report, it adds it as an attachment. So I don't need to reprint. If I need to reprint it, I can just access it from there. Okay. So down here in my commodity item, you'll see um, I've received my baby spinach. I have my crop year. What we also have, uh, have the ability to do on our commodity receipt is actually receive in containers. So if you're actually providing uh, plastic containers or drums or totes or pallets that actually the farmer actually takes out, fills with product and brings back to you, you own those and you want to keep track of those or you actually want to tear them out as well. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select flats. So I'm going to receive some flats with this. Okay. And I'm going to tell the system how many, how many containers I'm actually bringing in. So I'm going to say that I brought in 30 flats. Okay, and you'll see now that my tear weight now, I have 30 flats here, so now it's really deducted from that weight. So now my true product weight now is 1,070. Okay, so I've set up tears against my various container types that will actually factor into the weight, and also, I, you know, as part of this commodity receiving process, I'm actually going to bring those containers back into inventory, um, and then so I can track what, what grower has what, what, uh, what containers, okay, that they actually return some back in again. All right. So down here in my in my item line, okay, I'm just going to scroll scroll across here, and um, of course this is a lot tracked item, so I'm going to put a lot number in. Let's just use today's date. I can also have this assigned by, from a number series as well if I wish. Okay. Um, then um, you know, so I can go across, you know, here I can see my different options. What I'm going to jump into now is we're going to look at our you know our bonus that we looked at earlier, our bonus or our dockage. Okay. So now I've received my product. Um, I haven't received it in exactly yet. I filled in all of my commodity receipt. Quality is there on the dock and quality is actually checking the product. So they're doing some sampling at different intervals, at different flats, one from the top, one from the bottom, whatever your internal process is. And they're kind of measuring the percentage of dockage, you know, based on weight and, and, uh, and things like that. And they're also measuring the color, okay, at various points throughout the load. So I'm going to go into my lock QA attributes here. I'm going to open the QA worksheet, okay. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to um, pick, I have a couple of different quality audits here, but the one I'm going to, uh, the one I use is I'm going to use my spinach one. Okay. So you'll see that I have a couple of different values here. I can fill in my, you know, some comments if I wish. Okay. Uh, but what I'm going to do is the dockage weight. Okay. So I'm going to do the dockage weight as, uh, as a two. Okay. So I found a 2%, you know, um, you know, of foreign materials. And then I'm going to set my color at 96, so an average of 96 across the load, okay? If I want to do multiple sampling, then I can go to the next line down and say, you know, like, you know, I found a dockage weight of three and then, you know, not a color of 80. And then, you know, I can do various samplings here and the system will average those all out, you know, to give you what my target total is and then figure out the dockage based on that. Right now, I'll just do one sampling aggregated amounts that we have here, Okay. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to change my status of my uh, of, of my order, okay, of my of my quality check. So I'm going to say this is actually completed, okay. I'm just going to escape to go back to my order, and you'll see I have my quality attributes here, and those those full in. So you know full, pull in from the quality. I'm going to then I'm going to calculate my charges, okay. I don't have a bricks on there. I don't know why it's looking for my bricks. Let me see. I'm just going to refresh this page, see if we can. All right, so down here we have our dockage and our weight. Let's calculate our charges. Okay, so this is a commodity receipt 59. Okay, don't know why it's looking for bricks. Let's see if I can have. Okay, so what would happen is when I calculate my charges up here, okay, it's going to actually bring in my, my allowances here. So it's going to bring in a dockage weight, okay, 
So I have my, my, my total quantity here, then it's going to bring in my dockage weight. So I'm actually docking them $30 and 43 cents for the, uh, for the weight, for the um, things that I found in the load that weren't supposed to be there. And then I'm also giving them a, the color bonus of 6087. So depending on how I have these, um, these allowances or charges set up, I can have these set up as GL accounts that are going to post, or I can also have these set up as allowances, like item charges, which are going to apply against the item in there and factor into the costing and things like that. Okay. So either or, the way I set those, those charge components up, that's how those actually flow in and create separate lines on the commodity receipt. Okay. So I've, created, I've calculated my, char I have my item and I have my charges on here as well. Um, I can immediately go in here and I can post this and I have a couple of options which are familiar to most of you in the system. So I can receive this in or I can receive an invoice in. Okay, the different, um, different uh, certain implementations, they decide to receive an invoice this immediately because the, everything has been captured. I've captured the, the item, the lot, the, the, the dockage and that sort of thing. So I just want to go ahead and invoice it, you know, and, and have the payment actually split. Or I can basically receive it and then I can use a commodity statement to actually bring in multiple receipts onto that commodity statement and post those from invoice all at once. Okay, kind of very similar to receiving uh, your purchase orders and then creating a purchase invoice and pulling in the receipt lines for those of you who do that kind of activity. Okay, so I'm just going to check one thing uh, on here. So I'm going to check our payment schedule. So I have that set up here. Okay. So I'm going to post this. I'm going to, this one I'm going to receive an invoice, but I'll show you on the commodity uh, statement how we actually pull um, orders in. Okay. So here's my posted invoice. I have my uh, my item charge lines and, and that sort of thing on here. Okay. I'm just going to go to more options here and let's navigate. Okay. So you'll see here my vendor ledger entries. And this is what I wanted to show you here with the vendor ledger entries is I have my, my uh, harvest advance, my progress payment, and my final payment. So by splitting that, um, that, that AP transaction into three separate vendor ledger entries, then it allows me to use my, my payment journal to suggest vendor payments and pull in all of my harvest advances for a specific grower or vendor and pay those all in one check. And then I want to do the progress payment. And then of course across here, Okay, I have my, you know, as I'm going across, I have a due date set up for each of these with my amounts. Um, you know, so I have my due date, which is my 10 days, and then, of course, my 60 days, my 120 days, right? So I have my three different values here split automatically for me. Um, and then I have my payment class here as well, which allows me to then filter those as well. Okay. So nice, the way it sets, uh, it, it, it splits those vendor ledger entries, allowing me to pay those all separately. So we'll come back to we'll come to the payment journal in a, in a minute. Let's just jump back, back out to the main menu and let's look at a commodity statement. Okay. So let's do a commodity statement. And you would use a commodity statement in terms of you would actually just do the receiving, have them, you know, on the on the scale side of things, they're filling in all the driver's information, the item, the lot, doing their quality checks, and they're just receiving, bringing the inventory in. Okay. And then, then um, from a finance on the finance side of things, you're going to do the invoicing step to create the AP. So on a commodity statement, I would fill in the grower, the ranch, etc. And then down in the lines, okay, I would go down to uh, more options here and functions, and I would actually get receipt lines. So what that's going to do is go into that grower and look at all of my different receipts for all my commodity items. And I, then I would select those and then pull this, these ones here for barley because I invoiced the other. Um, but I would bring those lines in here and then post this, which would actually create my invoice. Okay. So what that allows me to do is kind of split that transaction into a receiving transaction and an invoicing transaction. Okay. If you decide to do it that way and do the statement sort of thing. OK, but function, fun, functioning exactly the same as, you know, just immediately posting the invoice from the commodity receipt. OK, so let's jump over, um, you know, to the payment journal, because that's where we'll kind of see the lien holder functionality that we've set up. Okay, so for those of you familiar, um, you know, I'm just going to delete this line here because we were looking at this the other day. So, um, so let's just delete that line. Okay, 
So up in my payment journals here, I'm going to, um, sorry, let me escape back out of here again. Um, so up here in my process, this is where I'm going to suggest my vendor payments. Okay. So in my suggest vendor payments, um, you'll see here I have this payment class code. And if you remember when I split those three separate vendor ledger entries, it's going to tag each of those with that category or that class code that I set up in the payment schedule. What that allows me to do is then go through and filter on I just want to, right now, I just want to go through and pay all my harvest advances. And then now I want to do my progress payments. And now I want to do all my final payments. Okay, so I can do that information, you know, set, setting up my standard last payment date using my harvest advance and then actually setting a filter on my vendor or my grower. Okay, so now I have my payment that I did, the, the one that I posted yesterday plus the one that I just posted. Um, if I scroll across here, you'll see um, these are my two amounts. All right. Okay, it applies to my document and my computer check, etc. So we're pretty familiar with that information. So here in this check address name contact information, what this allows me to do is then go in and select a contact. Okay, so I can select a, a you know, create a new contact or let's just create a new contact here for, um, you know, a, for a lien holder. So I'm going to do this as Beck Family, uh, Family Farms and myself to make sure that I get the check. Okay. Farms and okay, okay. So I'm going to just uh, F8 to copy the one above it. So what that's actually going to do is um, what that's going to do is then when I print out that check, instead of actually just printing out Bex Family Farms as the account name on the check, it's actually going to print out the name from the contact meaning that it's actually going to print out Beck Family Farms and my name, Kirk Southcott, so that both the farm and the lien holder both get their name on the check so that both of them have to sign off on that. Okay. So what that allows me to do is then, you know, kind of configure the name based on a contact and that's what we've linked it in through the contact. Okay. So let's see if we can, um, let's see if we can print these checks. Okay, one check per vendor, and then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to um, print it. Okay, so you'll see here now the name on the check actually prints out as um, as as you know as both myself and the and the and the grower, so that making sure that both of those sign off on the check to make sure before it's cashed. Okay, so it gives you a little bit more control, you know, if the if the grower actually asks you to actually, you know, make the check out to them and another person or multiple people as long as they'll fit within that um, within that name uh, on the check. Okay, the check is actually going to be, you know, printed and go to the vendor's account, which is Beck Family Farms, but from a naming perspective to make sure that the lien holder gets their portion of the check, both names actually print on the check. Okay. Okay, so now we've actually received an invoice. So I've had some questions, uh, you know, um, with ongoing implementations that we're working on now is that now we've received an invoice date. We've we processed those uh, those charges against it for the bonus and for the and for the um, you know dockage. And we find something else, you know, when we bring it into the warehouse and we start actually processing it. Okay, so if I do want to apply a you know uh, um, you know a credit back against that from a dollar perspective, I can do a purchase credit memo with an item charge linking the item charge to the original receipt. Okay, and applying it against that to then further reduce the cost as well. Okay, so something it's not the be all and end all. If I do find something else later um, that affects the quality of the product or something like that, or if I do my quality checks later. Um, and not at the time of the commodity receipt, I can always do those with a purchase credit memo or a purchase invoice to either increase or decrease that, you know, the AP amount and apply that into the cost using an item charge. Okay, so let me just jump back to my PowerPoint presentation here. Okay, so... One of the things I wanted to emphasize in this is really the grower counting is more than just accounting because it does interact with quality, it does interact with the scale, it is receiving, it's inventory based, um, and, you know, and that sort of thing. 
Um, so we looked at commodity contracts, creating a commodity receipt from the contract, or of course you could go into the commodity receipt, start from scratch right there when the truck shows up on the scale, um, and then link it to the contract afterwards to debit against that. We looked at some of the commodity containers. I used flats in our example, so we can have those have those received back into inventory as well as affect the um, the, the the true you know net weight of the item you're receiving. Looked at some of the setup with ranches, blocks, and fields. Of course, you don't have to use all of those components, but they are available there to you if you want to track down to that detailed level. And then at the field level, bring in spray reports and things like that, which is which is which is common to actually have to track which which um, which products were actually placed on uh, sprayed on the items from a pest control perspective. We can also look at the different crop years and do filtering and and um, things like that by crop year. Looked at grower payments and schedules. We looked at how you can set up those schedules with the different payment class codes and, and splitting those payments on the vendor ledger entry. Um, and we looked at the grower settlements, doing a settlement report, pulling in the, the, the receipts into that, you know, if you haven't posted them ahead of time. And then when you're doing your, your payments, you can actually at that time pick, uh, you know, the contact that you actually want to print on the check. And that may be a last minute thing, you know, after you've done your commodity receipts um, and, the, and the invoice is already in the vendor's account. The vendor may actually call you up, you know, the day before and say, oh, by the way, can you make that check out to me and somebody else? OK, so it gives you that flexibility at the time of printing the check to actually, you know, edit the names that are going to print on that from a, a lien holder perspective. So for my contact information, um, you can get hold of me at Kirk at BeckConsulting.com as always. Um, sales at BeckConsulting.com will get our whole sales group. Um, our recordings are on our website um, at bcfooderp.com. So if you go to the ERP Unlocked, you'll find all of our previous webinars there as well as today's recording will be up there by the end of today once we get it converted. Okay, and then just a bit of a preview of our next webinar. So this is going to be on Jet Reports. You know, it used to be called Jet, the company was called Jet Reports, now it's called Jet Global, and one of their products is Jet Reports. Um, so we'll introduce our partner. Uh, we'll start looking at um, how to, you know, what what the different versions of Jet Reports, what Jet Reports actually is from a reporting perspective, how you can use it, some of the great formulas that come with Jet, um, how you can use what most of you are familiar with, which is Microsoft Excel, to actually generate some reports and you know and access uh, information in the database or the data warehouse. Um, so we'll look at, and then we'll finalize this with looking at how you can schedule reports. You can set up a schedule in the Jet Reports, which automatically just sends out, you know, a report every day or every Monday to a group of users. You know, refreshes the data and actually sends it out. So we'll look at some of those functionalities then as well. So the the inv invite for that will be going out shortly if you haven't gotten it already. Um, and uh, I hope you can join us for our next webinar. And thank you for joining us today. And please feel free to reach out to me. Again, my contact information is up on the screen. If you have any questions about grower accounting or um, or how you could make use of grower accounting commodity receipts. Okay, thank you and have a great day, everyone.